back from Angkasa Puri with the latest news. I'm Shuhaida Arifin and this is News at 10. Making a headlines tonight. BN to decide the need to merge with other parties after GE15. School syllabus cannot be changed frequently. Prime Minister Dato Sri Ismail Sabri Yaakob today assured qualified local contractors that they will give the best opportunity to develop national projects. Thus, he refuted various allegations that the allocation of development expenditure of 95 billion ringgit in the 2023 budget will only benefit certain parties. Selain daripada itu, budget 2023 turut menyediakan Pelbagai inisiatif untuk golongan kontraktor seperti peruntukan sebanyak 500 juta ringgit khusus kepada kontraktor kelas G1 hingga G4 antaranya bagi melaksanakan kerja-kerja penyelenggaraan bagi jalan persekutuan, jamak titi dan jambatan kecil, rumah ibadat serta infrastruktur yang rosak akibat banjir. He said as much as 50 million ringgit worth of small projects will also be allocated to G1 to G4 class female contractors through their Contractor Nita initiative to support the participation of more Bumiputra female contractors in government procurement. The Premier also said that the government realises that in such a challenging economic environment, not many contractors are willing to be involved in low-cost housing projects with low returns, especially with the uncertain price of building materials. Therefore, he said, the cabinet has approved an additional allocation to increase the price of the construction of the hardcore poor housing project PPRT and People's Housing Program PPR unit to 68,000 ringgit from 55,000 ringgit. Dato Sri Ismail Sabri also called on all contractors involved in government projects to show the best performance in terms of quality, productivity, professionalism and to complete the project on time. On another note, commenting on foreign workers, Dato Sri Ismail Sabri said the recruitment process will continue but the government will still give priority to local workers. Kalau tak ada di bawah program, di bawah pekerjaan 3D itu, barulah kita ambil pekerja asing. Setengah itu semua nak bawa pekerja daripada luar. Daripada luar, semua nak bawa. Kalau dulu hotel punya front desk tu, semua kebanyakannya daripada Filipin. Padahal sedangkan pekerja rakyat kita pun masih boleh. Jadi dasar kajian keutamaan adalah pekerja tempatan selepas itu barulah pekerja-pekerja daripada luar. On another note, Dato Sri Ismail Sabri says the decision on whether Barisan Nasional PN will merge with other parties if it was unable to secure a simple majority in parliament to form the new government will only be made after the 15th general election, GE15. The Premier said any future plan, especially on the matter, would depend on the results of the GE15. Kita... Kita tunggu dulu keputusan, lepas itu kita akan buat ya, keputusan selepas itu. Ya? Jadi kita cross the bridge dulu lah. Lepas itu kita buat keputusan. Kita buat andaian terlalu awal pun susah juga. Ya? Kita pun tak tahu apa yang akan berlaku dalam pelan raya nanti. Jadi lepas pelan raya nanti, keputusan dah buat, insya Allah kita akan buatlah apa-apa saja keputusan demi kepentingan negara dan yang pentingnya kita nakkan sebuah kajian yang stabil. Jadi selepas itu kita putuskanlah ya.
He said this when asked about the possibility for BN to forge a coalition with other parties like PAS to form the government if it was unable to secure an adequate number of seats in parliament at the GE15. Meanwhile, Dr. Sri Ismail Sabri, who is also AMNO vice president, said BN is still in the midst of completing the seat allocation process among its component parties, as well as parties deemed as friends of BN before it could focus on the candidates. Communications and Multimedia Minister Tan Sri Anam Musa is ready to defend the Kateri parliamentary seat if he is re-nominated as candidate in the 15th general election. Speaking to reporters after launching the Malam Kemuncak Anugerah Sri Angka CSA 2022 countdown in Putrajaya today, Tan Sri Anwar said Amno Kateri had made early preparations to face GE15. Sebenarnya ramai bukan saya saja. Sentiasa teringin menjadi calon. Kalau kita ada keinginan untuk berkhidmat, maka kena ada keinginan untuk menjadi calon. Itu keinginan. Tetapi sama ada jadi calon, kalau nak mewakili parti, mana-mana parti, partilah yang menentukan, bukan kita. In the last general election, Tansri Anwar defeated past candidate Wan Ismail Wan Jusoh and Pakatan Harapan candidate Dato Dr. Razi Jidin with a majority of 4,626 votes. On another matter, Tan Sri Anwar said the Special Task Force on Jihad Against Inflation is still functioning as usual, even though the government is now a caretaker government following the dissolution of the parliament. He added that the task force was not disbanded because inflation-related problems were still the government's responsibility. Pasukan khas jihad apa ni tidak mengadakan mesyuarat sejak parlimen dibubarkan kerana setelah parlimen dibubarkan semua ahli-ahli parlimen dan wakil rakyat bergegas pulang ke kawasan ke kawasan masing-masing tapi kita berhubung satu sama lain jika ada keperluan kita akan mengadakan mesyuarat minggu depan on 29 June, Prime Minister Datuk Sri Ismail Sabri Yaakob announced the formation of the Special Task Force on Jihad Against Inflation to help Kuala Malaysia face the rising cost of living. The school syllabus developed by the Education Ministry MOE has its cycle and cannot be changed every year. Speaking to reporters after launching the Reading Progress Initiative in Shah Alam today, Senior Education Minister Dr. Ruta Razujidin explained that developing a new syllabus also requires in-depth study involving many experts and experienced and capable teachers. Because all this while, adalah karena bila kalau syllabus ini tukar kerap, then cikgu dan murid-murid menghadapi kesukaran nak nak adapt to new syllabus kalau setiap tahun nak tukar sebagai contoh jadi apa yang berlaku selama ini pendekatan syllabus kita apabila selesai satu pusingan maka review akan dibuat untuk melihat keberkesanan syllabus tersebut satu pusingan ni maknanya apa kalau dia masuk darjah satu dengan syllabus tersebut dia akan habis darjah enam dengan pendekatan syllabus tersebut Sebab itu batch atau kohort Rajah 1 2017 adalah merupakan kohort pertama guna syllabus itu dan mereka pada waktu ini berada pada tahun 6. Jadi syllabus 2017 ini selesai pusingan dia pada tahun ini untuk sekolah rendah. Okay. Untuk sekolah menengah, syllabus 2017 ini selesai pusingan dia pada tahun lepas. He said this in response to concerns raised by a teacher, Muhammad Fadli Muhammad Saleh, on social media that the primary school mathematics syllabus is too advanced and unsuitable for the age group. Dr. Dr. Razi also said that the ministry has never stopped teachers from voicing their views over the education system, adding that he himself went down to meet them to solve an issue, including heavy school bags among pupils. Regarding allegations of embezzlement in the MOE, Datuk Dr. Razi said the Ministry Secretary General, Datuk Yusran Shah Muhammad Yusof, had followed his directive to lodge a report with the Malaysian Anti Corruption Commission, MACC. I'm very uh, open ya kita saya ni orang terus tak ada tak ada apa yang saya nak nak, nak khuatirkan ya, sebab itu uh, uh, KSU sedang uh, saya ingat saya telah mengambil tindakan uh, seperti mana yang diarahkan because kita nak pastikan ya image kementerian uh, sejak saya masuk ke kementerian message kita setiap sen duit rakyat mesti dikembalikan kepada rakyat that's it very simple
Malaysia agrees to implement two pin attacks approach. Stay with us. Malaysia has agreed to implement the two-pillar approach in taxation to create a competitive environment for both foreign and domestic direct investments. The two-pillar approach refers to the Base Erosion and Profit Shifting 2.0 initiative spearheaded by the Organisation for Economic Cooperation and Development and G20. In his keynote speech at the 51st Study Group on Asia-Pacific Tax Administration and Research Annual Meeting 2022 today, Finance Minister Tengku Datuk Seri Zafro Tengku Abdul Aziz said the approach, which also prevents cross-border tax evasion, is being studied at present and estimated to begin in 2024. He also said that the government intends to face the electronic invoicing system starting next year in order to improve the efficiency of the government's tax system. The implementation of e-invoicing will also aid in the implementation of a sustainable electronic business ecosystem. E-invoicing implementation provides a more reliable audit trail, resulting in increased tax transparency and is viewed as one of the primary strategies for increasing tax revenue. Malaysia has agreed with the recent implementation of oil production cut of 2 million barrels per day by the Organisation of the Petroleum Exporting Countries and Allies, OPEC+, Plus, with effect from November 2022. Minister and Prime Minister's Department for Economy, Dato Sri Mustafa Muhammad, said the decision was unanimous. Elaborating further through a statement released today, the minister said the decision was made after OPEC plus countries collectively took into consideration factors that include market fundamentals, particularly to address uncertainties in the global oil supply and demand situation. He said Malaysia supports OPEC Plus' long-standing initiative and proactive approach, including the document of cooperation signed on 10 December 2016 that brings together the oil-producing countries to adhere to the robust mechanism in dealing with market challenges. He said Malaysia, which is a member of OPEC Plus, would continue its close collaboration with the organisation to ensure the stability of the global oil market in view of the prospect of prolonged uncertainties. In early October, OPEC Plus announced the largest supply cut since 2020 by 2 million barrels per day amid the uncertainty that surrounds the global economy and oil market outlooks. Malaysia will cut its daily crude oil output by 27,000 barrels to 567,000 under a planned collective production reduction by OPEC Plus. The Sultan of Perak, Sultan Nazrin Shah, has expressed sadness and concern about the way in which words like multiculturalism, diversity and tolerance have been weaponized in the culture wars of global political discourse today. The Sultan said this pervasive change in attitude towards multiculturalism is nothing short of a tragedy. It is a tragedy, of course, because it sows seeds of division within countries which can easily break out into violent conflict, leading to the mass displacement of individuals and the refugee crisis I spoke about earlier. But it is a tragedy too because of what we stand to lose when we reject and deny cultural diversity. The Sultan said while the Sterling model combines measurements of variety, balance and disparity to assess the diversity of cultural expression. Other social scientists have taken measures of ethnic, linguistic and religious fractionalization within countries to demonstrate the ethnic fractionalization is a significant predictor of economic performance. The Yang Di-Pertuan Agong Sultan Abdullah Riayatuddin Al-Mustafa Billah Shah today conferred the Panglima Gagah Angkatan Tentera PGAT Award to Chief of Air Force General Tan Sri Muhammad Ashgar Khan Goriman Khan. Tan Sri Muhammad Ashgar headed the list of 284 award recipients at the first session of the Investiture Ceremony for Military Service DKAT 2022 held at the Balerung Sri Istana Negara. 
At the ceremony, His Majesty also conferred the Dajah Panglima Setia Angkatan Tentera PSAT Award to 12 recipients, including two foreign military officers, Pahlawan Angkatan Tentera PAD, to 34 recipients, including one foreign military officer, Kesatria Angkatan Tentera KAT, and Bentara Angkatan Tentera BAT to 118 recipients and 114 recipients, respectively. Foreign military officers from Indonesia, Thailand, Saudi Arabia, Brunei and the Philippines were also awarded with the PGAT award. Two military officers from Saudi Arabia also received the PSAT award, namely Major General Fahad Saad Al Johani and Major General Pilot Ahmad Ali Al Dubais. While the PAT honorary recipient was Brigadier General Abdullah Khalid Al Yamini, also from Saudi Arabia. The DKAT awards were conferred to qualified officers and personnel of various ranks for their contributions and sacrifices in the service. The second session of the investiture ceremony will take place this Thursday. Australia no longer recognizes Jerusalem as Israel's capital. Stay tuned. Australia would no longer recognize West Jerusalem as Israel's capital, reversing a contentious decision by the previous Conservative government. Foreign Minister Penny Wong today said the city's status would be decided through peace talks between Israelis and Palestinians and not through unilateral decisions. In 2018, a conservative government led by Scott Morrison followed former U.S. President Donald Trump's lead in naming West Jerusalem as the Israeli capital. The move caused a domestic backlash in Australia and caused a friction with a neighbouring Indonesia, temporarily derailing a free trade deal. Jerusalem is claimed by both Israelis and Palestinians, and most foreign governments avoid formally declaring it the capital of any state. Uh, today, uh, the government has reaffirmed Australia's previous and long-standing position that Jerusalem is a final status issue, uh, and a final status issue that should be resolved as part of any peace negotiations between Israel and the Palestinian peoples. This reverses the Morrison government's recognition of West Jerusalem as the capital of Israel. Wong accused the Morrison government of being motivated by a by-election in a beachside Sydney suburb with a sizable Jewish community. She insisted that the decision did not signal any hostility to Israel. Canberra's decision is unlikely to come as a shock to the Israeli government. The policy reversal was foreshadowed by the removal of language on the Israeli capital on the website of Australia's Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade. A Hong Kong pro-democracy protesters were assaulted in the grounds of the Chinese consulate in Manchester, northern England, on Sunday. Local police said that a group of men came out of the consulate as protesters held a peaceful demonstration outside the compound and dragged one of the protesters inside the grounds before assaulting him. The victim, a man in his 30s, suffered several injuries and spent the night in the hospital. Video footage posted on Twitter showed a man kicked protesters' banners and scuffled with a group of demonstrators at the gates of the consulate. Then a group of men were shown punching a protester lying on the ground inside its gates. Meanwhile, China accused the demonstrators of illegally entering Beijing's consulate. Chinese Foreign Ministry spokesman Wang Wenbin said the protesters were to blame, adding that they illegally entered the Chinese consulate general in Manchester, endangering the security of the premises. He urged the UK government to fulfil its duties and take effective measures to step up protection of the premises and personnel of the Chinese embassy and consulates. The protest took place as China opened its five yearly Communist Party Congress, where President Xi Jinping is widely expected to be handed a historic third term in power. Russian forces had destroyed a third of Ukraine's power stations in repeated strikes that targeted energy infrastructure and caused blockouts across the country. Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky said that since 10 October, 30 percent of Ukraine's power stations have been destroyed, causing massive blackouts across the country. 
Several regions of Ukraine, including the capital Kiev, were experiencing power cuts after a new round of strikes hit energy facilities. In Kiev, energy operators Tech said there were interruptions to the electricity and water supply to the residents of the capital's left bank. Part of Zitomi region west of Kiev were also without electricity after strikes on an energy facility. Power cuts were reported in parts of Dnipro region in central Ukraine following a strike on energy infrastructure that caused fire and serious damage. There were also interruptions in water supply on the left bank of Dnipro city, he added, while the neighbouring city of Pavlograd was without water after a strike on a critical infrastructure facility. In the southern city of Mykolaiv, overnight strikes hit a residential building in the central district, killing at least one person, as well as a flower market in the same area. Up next in sports, Sosa clinched the yellow jersey, crowned as overall winner for LTDL 2022. Colombian rider Ivan Romero Sosa Curvo clinched the yellow jersey as the overall champion of the Lotto de Langkawi LTDL 2022, competing in the eighth and final stage of the race. Covering a distance of 115.9 kilometers, the Movistar team rider made sure of the coveted yellow jersey with a 23 second advantage over EF Education Easy Sport rider Hugh John Carthy. Sosa becomes the first Colombian and South American LTDL winner since his compatriot Julian David Arredondo, Team Nipo de Rosa, managed the feat in 2013. Earlier during the Stage 8 of the LTDL around Pulau Langkawi, Burgos BH rider Alexander Molena came out tops in 2 hours, 25 minutes and 37 seconds, followed by Alpecin Dachonix Jason Osborne and UAE Team Emirates Yuan Sebastian Molano Benavides. There was double delight for the Turanganu Polygon Cycling Team, TSG, when Mohamed Nur Aiman Mohamed Zarif took the red jersey, King of the Mountain, with 29 points, and teammate Jambal Jamsain Baya, the white jersey, Best Asian Rider. The green jersey, Sprint King, went to Stage 6 winner Arlen Blikra of Uno X Pro Cycling Team with 49 points. For team category, TSG won the Best Asia team, while Movistar team topped the Best Overall team. The 26th edition of LTDL closed its curtain today after traversing over 1,000 km of total distance. Indonesian President Joko Widodo received a visit from World's Football Governing Body FIFA President Gianni Infantino at the Merdeka Palace in Jakarta today. Infantino's visit to Indonesia is a follow-up to his letter to the Indonesian President regarding plans to transform the Indonesian football scene following the Kanjuruhan Stampede incident earlier this month. In the visit, Infantino pledged to help reform and transform Indonesian football two weeks after the country suffered one of the worst disasters in the sport's history. The visit came about a year before the Under-20 World Cup is due to be held in the Southeast Asian nation. His assurances came as hospital officials said a 33-year-old man had died from injuries sustained in the Kanjuruhan Stadium crush, bringing the confirmed death toll to 133. Infantino said FIFA will work closely with the government, with the Asian Football Confederation and with the Federation of Indonesia, with the main focus would be improving stadium operations and fan behaviour, as well as creating programmes for football in schools. Widodo said he agreed with FIFA on a thorough transformation of Indonesian football to ensure all aspects of the matches follow the international safety standards set up by FIFA. Infantino said FIFA would work with the Indonesian government to ensure the Under-20 World Cup can go ahead safely. The youth tournament is scheduled to take place in May, June 2023 in multiple cities across the archipelago nation. Following his meeting with Infantino, Indonesian President Jokowi said the Kanjuruhan Stadium in Malang will be demolished and a new stadium with better standards and facilities will be rebuilt according to FIFA standards with proper facilities that can ensure the safety of both players and supporters. Menyampaikan dan FIFA mengapresiasi untuk stadion Kanjuruhan di Malang juga akan kita 
diperuntukkan dan kita bangun lagi sesuai dengan standar FIFA sebagai sebuah contoh standar stadion dengan fasilitas fasilitas yang baik transformasi persepak bola Indonesia akan dimulai bersama-sama dengan FIFA dan FIFA akan berkantor di Indonesia sampai semuanya berjalan dengan baik. With the MERS 999 application system, getting emergency assistance is now easier. Save Me 999 Police connects the Malaysian public to the police. Save Me 999 Deaf for those with hearing or speech impairments. And Save Me 999 Blind for those with visual impairments. Download now for free on your smartphones. MERS 999 and applications make emergency calls easier. And that's it for tonight's News at 10. Headline of the night. BN to decide after GE15 if it needs to merge with other parties to form government. Don't forget to tune in to updates at noon tomorrow on TV2 and Sarurabita RTM. Before we switch to off the lights off, here's a clip of life-size Lamborghini made up from 400,000 Lego pieces at Paris Auto Show. I'm Shahid Arifin. Goodbye for now.